Donc, c'est toi l'animateur au premier. Ça marche. Ça marche. Okay. So, we can start now, uh, Manu? Yeah, I've seen the, uh, the yes. so, All right, so, hello, everyone. Um, Uh, my name is, is Franck Nicou from the University of, of Montpellier, and I'm, of course, very happy to welcome all of you uh, to this seminar. Um, maybe you have seen from the uh, announcement of this, uh, of this seminar that this is actually a part of an initiative that we have here in, in Montpellier, what we call a key initiative on interdisciplinary broad science. So our general objective is to just gather people together uh, coming from different backgrounds. And so uh, we have this, uh, we have set up this series of seminar and uh, we have had already uh, two sessions earlier this year, uh, which were more dedicated to uh, looking at red blood cells at the cellular level. Um, and uh, so today uh, we are very happy that uh, um, our guest is uh, David Koo uh, from Georgia Tech. Um, so David, to my opinion, is just a, a perfect example of what interdisciplinarity uh, can be or could be. Uh, he's uh, the director of the Center for Entrepreneurship Program uh, for Engineering Entrepreneurship at Georgia Tech. Uh, he is also a, a um, regions professor of mechanical engineering. And um, maybe I'm wrong, David, you will correct me, but I believe that you also hold a, uh, a degree of medical doctor from Emory. I do, yes. I'm so surgeon. quite a very large you know, spectrum of, of expertise, huh? um, obviously. So um, David is not only doing, uh, uh, being extremely active uh, for so, uh, these two uh, thematics that I have mentioned before, but uh, he's also, uh, he also has a very uh, great interest in um, how to improve and how to commercialize uh, novel uh, medical devices. Uh, and uh, uh, actually he has been uh, involved and he has created uh, several startup companies uh, in order to do so uh, properly. And um, so uh, today, David is going to talk about um, how uh, um, interdisciplinary uh, approaches and biophysics uh, can be used in order to, to best, better understand and, and better treat some medical disorders, um, especially related, related to, to blood and, and maybe specifically to uh, thrombosis. So David, uh, if you uh, would like to, to start now. All right. OK. Thank you, Thank you very much for that. Um kind introduction. Uh, Frank, it's been, it's a real pleasure for me to, to re revisit people in Montpellier. I was able to go a few years ago to uh, Montpellier and give a, a small seminar. And I think that was, was really, uh, you have an, a fabulous group there. And uh, I was able to steal someone as a postdoc. <laughs> <laughs> and that was was terrific, and and she has been a postdoc during this COVID times, and I will talk about all these people shortly. Um, let me try and share screen if I can. And one last thing: pointer options. All right, um, today's talk will be on biophysics, novel understanding and treatment of disease. I will try and um, do this in a way that it's not much in depth, actually. You will see uh, the people that have helped, uh, they, they have contributed in, in many deep ways into this study, but in the interest of showing that this disease can um, be approached with an interdisciplinary approach. I'm going to show just a few slides on many topics, and uh, this will hopefully attract people that are in different fields that they may not have realized that their work could be directly applicable to the treatment of blood diseases or the study of blood. And uh, hopefully one or two of the slides will be of interest to you. Um, and this will give you an overview of some of the work that is being done in biophysics. The clinical problem that drives a lot of our work is really uh, heart attacks and strokes. Heart attacks and strokes, um, most people know, are, is what causes most of the, the deaths in the modern world. Um, and the 
aspect about it that is interesting to me is that you have blood flow going in these arteries or blood vessels that are branching tubes. And when it blocks, the arteries become stenotic. But that stenosis or atherosclerosis builds up over decades. It could be 40 years before they really uh, become smaller, but usually they are not flow limiting. They just become narrow, but not really flow limiting. However, when you die of a heart attack or you have a stroke, there is an acute thrombosis or a blood clot that blocks the artery completely. And that blocks it in usually around 30 minutes, 30 to 60 minutes. So it happens very suddenly so that the thrombosis can happen very quickly. And it is really at the edge of physics to think about how can that really happen? How could it happen in this quick a time frame? How can thrombi be strong enough to hold it because there's hundreds of millimeters of mercury pressure on that? So you would think that that pressure would want to break it apart. And then of course we want to say, how can we stop this and can we treat this in a better way? So the typical way of looking at blood clotting is to look at blood clots that are from the textbook. And the textbook, you will find lots of uh, discussion about coagulation. And these coagulation cascades are through a serine protease cascade of 12 factors that go all the way. And it's always very hard to remember what's going on for the medical students to try and figure out how you get from fibrinogen to fibrin through all of these different proteins or serine proteases. And then the, besides the 12 factors that are involved in this coagulation cascade, there are three major factors that Verkau figured out almost 200 years ago that you need to have very low shear or almost stagnant blood you have to have these coagulation factors and endothelial cell disruption. When you have this sort of damage, then you end up with a red clot. Unfortunately, that is what most of the textbooks show. And they essentially, only in past recent years have there been a lot of study towards a different pathway. And that different pathway is to show that blood clots can actually form by high shear, by platelets and VWF or von Willebrand's factor, and then a thrombogenic surface such as collagen. And that creates a different clot. And I will hopefully tell you a little bit about that and you can learn more about it. But these are white clots because on appearance, when you look at these clots, they are white instead of this red color that is with coagulation. This side is very interesting to a lot of people in biophysics because it creates a lot of issues that are at the margins of physics. How can that actually happen? And so while this can occur, coagulation, that occurs with stagnant conditions, and we will not spend too much time on that. And we'll talk a lot more about this other side, which is high shear. Some of the paradoxes that occur with coagulation, just to set that aside, is that coagulation is, occurs because of stagnation. But when you have an arterial stenosis, you have very high velocities going through the throat of that stenosis. That means that the platelets actually pass through the stenosis in less than one tenth of a second. However, coagulation, when you try and reproduce this in the lab or in a person, that coagulation takes minutes and usually on the order of 15 to 30 minutes. So when that stenosis, is exposed to blood for just a tenth of a second, coagulation could not happen in that time frame. The second, I mean, the third thing that is sort of contradictory or a paradox is that the thrombus must withstand, say, 200 millimeters of measure, mercury pressure or high pressures, because lots of people with heart attack have high blood pressure. So that means there's a lot of pressure pushing onto it and that these coagulation clots, if we look at that, are essentially too weak to cause that, to withstand that. So if you're going to get an arterial occlusion, you need to have something different than coagulation. However, if we look at these clots that are forming these white clots, these clots are made of 80% of platelets. And if they're 80% of platelets, that's not the same composition of platelets as in blood. Blood generally has only about 1% platelets. So somehow it has to accumulate in that spot and become very dense in a time frame that is um, 
uh, really quite remarkable. So let's look at this problem from a biophysics point of view. From the mechanics of, of, the, of biophysics, we can think of this flow going through this narrowed section very much like a venturi. So many of you have studied some sort of fluid mechanics before, and you know what a venturi is. So a venturi will cause flow to go, uh, to go through, there'll be constant flow through here by conservation of mass, but because the area, cross-sectional area is much smaller, then the velocities have to go much higher. And the velocities are often 10 to 100 times faster than upstream. So that creates a different condition at, at the walls which is called high shear stress. That's where the velocities are very high next to the wall. And as it, it um, extends through that, uh, if it's, it's moving very close to the wall, then it creates a force sort of like sandpaper that tries to pull everything along it. And that's called high shear stress and creates quite a large amount of drag force in that area. So in this type of situation, we have a growing, plaque that forms over decades and it narrows that artery. But as it grows and becomes more narrow, then this becomes a very high shear area. And eventually you can get a thrombus on top of it, which is a blood clot on top of it. And let's try and figure out how that might happen. If we look at the, quantify the shear rates in this section, this is easily done by computational fluid dynamics these days, you find that the shear rate and the shear stresses are about 100 times the normal shear stress in all the rest of our arteries. So it's a very high shear condition, and that's one of the things that we need to have. However, there are other things that need to cause this, this thrombus to create, to form. So what we tried to do is create an experiment to, ca to cause thrombus in this area, in the vicinity of this area. Some people thought that it's high shear stress that causes platelets to activate. Other things, people think that there's a recirculation region downstream of this, and that's where the platelets could attach. And so we wanted to have a reproducible system that we could uh, study uh, routinely in the laboratory. And um, so what we did was create a tubular stenosis that was true to scale of the coronary arteries. And that tubular stenosis had a high shear at the throat that comes just by st standard fluid mechanics. And then we wanted to look at optical visualization. Prior people looked at this with um, radio, uh, the radio labeled platelets and some other ways of looking at platelet adherence, uh, but not um, optical visualization all the way to occlusion. We used a high-speed digital video camera in order to, to see what's going on in tenths of a second, but it also all occludes in about 20 minutes. So you have to go to both ranges of digital video camera because you have a buffering problem and a frame rate problem. Then we also know from prior work, um, a lot of work done uh, by uh, uh, Sigma and De Groot about collagen surfaces, that you need a collagen surface to initiate this adherence. And so we put a collagen surface into this. And so this is what it looks like in, in true life. So this is actually done by a handheld camera back at about 20, uh, uh, 11 years ago, or actually it's about 15 years ago. We have flow going from left to right. And this whole process takes 22 minutes. So I don't want to show you this uh, over 22 minutes. So we speed it up. So after every 10 seconds, we jump ahead to two minutes. So now we're about four minutes into this. And you can start seeing some things that occur in this vicinity of the stenosis. In the vicinity here, we see that there are some white things that are appearing on the surface. And this white part tends to grow. And after about only eight minutes, this is we have a stenosis that is much greater than before. And so it's a narrower section. That means the velocity is going higher and higher. And now you can see that all the blood flow into the heart, let's say it, it supplies the heart blood, has to go through this really tiny section. So this is a close to a 90% stenosis in this artery or this glass tube artery. And this is growing away from the collagen surface. But some interesting ha things happen with blood because blood 
is actually a particulate flow situation. The red blood cells have slightly higher viscosity, and I mean, not this got density. And because of the higher density, it gets entrained into this jet. Now you see the jet and a clear separation region. And this separation region does not have much thrombus forming. The thrombus that is forming is in this high shear region right at the throat. And this will go all the way to occlusion. So that's the, the um, experimental setup that we have created. And that is, we can do this with uh, most blood from humans as well as pigs and mice. And we can then look at this clot and say, what is this clot made out of? So you can see here, we've taken out an entire clot and you can see the um, horn shape of the stenosis. And in here, there's clearly a solid piece of mass there. If we take this and slice it in half and we enhance this picture, you can see here's the enhanced picture and this are the thrombus that forms. And it, there's some interesting parts. So over here, downstream of the top of the apex of the throat, the thrombus is all in a mass and it goes and extends all the way across the blood vessel. So this is why it totally occludes, okay? But there are lots of ho holes in it or pores. And if you look further upstream, this is the situation before it totally occludes. You have these long fibers or strands of platelets that form out there and they're like strings or fingers. I call them fingers that reach all the way across and eventually coalesce when they meet. But before that, they are subject to this high shear stress. So they must be moving and flattening out um, and uh, can touch each other especially with pulsatile flow, because pulsatile flow will cause it to go forward and then potentially stop and then go forward again in the coronary arteries. So this feature is quite interesting. We can look at this in more histological sections and you see that it's very occluded downstream in this part here. It's really a solid mass, although even though it is a solid mass, it is full of some pores. And the blue means that it's made out of platelets, Upstream, you see these fingers that have coalesced and they still reach out here. And that's um, a, a different feature that precedes this massive occlusion. There are, it's mostly made out of platelets. That makes up the bulk of it. That's what the blue is in this stain. But there's also VWF. VWF is von Willebrand's factor, which is the connecting protein that is the longest protein in our blood. And it connects all the platelets to make this mass. So there's VWF all around here that are actually um, causing this aggregate to form. This is a picture of a red clot that has a coagulation clot that doesn't have any VWF or and there's very few platelets in it, just a few little blue things, but it's mostly red blood cells just as a contrast. So these clots are stiffer. The, we call it SEPA, shear induced platelet aggregation. So that means that it's shear induced. Once you've shear induced it, most of it's platelets. And we find that the modulus of elasticity is greater. This is some work by um, uh, uh, Dong Jun Kim, a PhD student of mine in collaboration with Yu Hong Hu, who is on the call. She's another one of my collaborators in the, in the solid mechanics area. But it's stronger in modulus, but more interesting, its ultimate strength is much greater. Its ultimate strength is between four to 50 kilopascals, which makes it sufficient to block um, uh, the arterial blood pressure. So if you do the, the uh, solid mechanics calculations of this, this type of level is uh, able to clot off arterial bleeds and cause an occlusion, whereas coagulation clots could not do it because it was, is not strong enough, it would break. So let's switch gears back to the physics side and think about how can we make this laboratory model a little bit better for use in the clinics? Or how can we understand this better from a physics point of view? Well, one of the issues is that we used a true to scale model initially and for 
these types of models, you need lots of blood, about one to two liters of blood to, to circulate through that. We actually don't do recirculation. We have just done this as a, a single flow through, um, a single pass so that you wouldn't be um, contaminating the blood upstream, but it takes a lot of blood and it's hard to get one liter of human blood. So how can we make this smaller? Well, we can do some dynamic scaling and use Reynolds number, as well as we need to think about not only Reynolds number, but something called the dam Kohler number. And some of you in mass transfer will re recognize this dam Kohler number, which is the ratio of convection time scales to kinetic time scales. It's the amount of flow going through our mass transfer compared to the kinetic rates of these reaction rates. We need to be able to make sure that both of these numbers are, are reasonable for our smaller models in order to get the same reactions occurring in the right scale. So we wanted to go to a microfluidics system because if you go to a microfluidics system, then you can reduce the amount of blood. But how small? We would like to get to the order of five mLs because five mLs is what you get in a test tube when you draw blood from, at least in the United States, it's common to use something called a vacutainer. And that's the kind of blood that we need to, to have. We need growth both at the surface of the collagen, but also in the bulk. Because as you saw in our, our video, most of the growth is actually in the bulk, away from the collagen. And that process is slightly different than the surface. So we want to examine how does this grow in bulk? It turns out if you do the calculations for microfluidics, then you come up that you need a microfluidics that's at least uh, say 70 microns, but in practice, 100 microns gives you most of the growth in bulk and less of growth in surface. And so while we can scale it down, we can't go to really nanoscales, otherwise we will have very different fluid mechanics as well as um, uh, solid mechanics in that area. So that tells us that we can create a microfluidic system. We just chose to create a parallel plate flow system. And in that parallel plate flow system for microfluidics, usually you take this and you make it smaller from the sides. That's easy to make with an SLA model. But if you want to keep them, maintain that parallel plate, then we want to go in the Z direction or change the depth of these um, uh, situations so we have still a, a parallel plate going across that. So, that took a little bit of, of doing, but from that we can create a pathological shear endpoint or, or conditions that create that high shear conditions at the throat. We wanted it to be long enough so that it was relevant to fluid mechanics, uh, to the, the pathology conditions. There are some other groups that have a needle that, that goes down and, and creates that constriction, but it is so short that platelets can't attach to that and you won't have 30 micron points in our blood vessel system, this is approximately one millimeter long. So we have relevant endpoints, and our goal was to create low vo blood volume and low variability. This is uh, some work done by um, Britt Van Roy uh, with uh, Alphonse Huckstra that she came over to our group and, and did some studies where she wanted to look at how the platelets accumulate. And so we're looking end on. So we're looking through this platelets, uh, this parallel plate, and the platelets start to accumulate here on the surface. And as they accumulate on the surface, you can see they will occlude the total whole blood. And now you see that it effectively stops. It's uh, effective, it's not actually completely stopped uh, until we. Uh, until later on, but it is an effective occlusion. And so now we can see where are the platelets accumulating and at what rate and quantify a lot of those processes. You can also use confocal microscopy. So some of you are studying uh, with, uh, uh, with confocal techniques, high speed um, cameras to be able to get a 3D image of this to find out exactly where the, the platelets are accumulating. We can quantify this and determine in our stenosis, this is the back to the capillary tubes, 
we can show over time that there's accumulations at the uh, throat of the stenosis and then calculate the shear rates. And we see that the shear rates start out maybe around 10, uh, 10 to the fourth, but go almost 10 to the fifth to 10 to the, close to 10 to the sixth when it's occluding. So this is really an amazingly high shear rate that these platelets have to stick on and continue to stick if they're going to grow. So from that, we use CFD in several different ways. So this gives you an idea of how you could use CFD to predict the accumulation. One could you could use continuum fluid mechanics to calculate just what is the shear rate through here. And by our prior work uh, of experiments, we can find out that the shear rate can drive the growth rate. The growth rate is a function of shear rate. And then we can grow these clots on the surface and the that as the shear goes up, then there's more clots uh, thrombus that is laid down. And we get these types of shapes. And this is essentially a phenomenological model. And from the experiment, we can see that it also grows in that same area at the throat of the stenosis in a, a similar way. Another way of looking at this would be at the cell level. So one can use a lattice Boltzmann fluid salvo. Uh, with spectrum link membrane. So we can calculate what is the mechanics of each red blood cell and then try and put this in a, a true flow and use a uh, lattice Boltzmann fluid solver to do that. But I find this very difficult to see because it's going sideways. So a, a lot of our questions were how do platelets actually get to the wall? And the way it could get to the wall is something called margination. So this uh, solver can predict the, solve, uh, the margination. And this is for an example, we have platelets that are rigid in this mass of red blood cells. The red blood cells are looked at an endon, since this is a computational data set, we can look at a Lagrangian view and find that the platelets tend to migrate towards the wall, primarily because they are stuck out there. Once they get out there, they're in that uh, cell-free layer, relatively cell-free layer of uh, few amounts of red blood cells, and they accumulate out here from margination. And this, this um, physics prediction matches experiments as to how much um, platelets can go to the wall. Of course, with this type of, of um, computational thing, we can change the rigidity of the red blood cells to look at sickle cell, and we can change the rigidity of the platelets to see whether that has an effect. And of course, both of those have an important effect. But we wanted to go further to try and understand the mechanism. And the mechanism has to link the molecules of thrombosis to the flow. And how do we get these sorts of things to all come together? And so we took a first principles approach to just look at all the necessary ingredients of SIPA. First, we need high shear. That's um, our flow solver and our flow solver uh, puts in a Coet type flow situation where we have high shear. Then we add collagen and VWF at the surface. In fact, we ignored the collagen part and just said, if we immobilize VWF uh, along the, the surface, what would that be like? And then we had to include blood components of platelets and VWF throughout here. And we have to uh, model how do these attract to each other and how would they act dynamically in a flow system? In order to do this, we actually had to come up with a completely different model that people had not described before. And this has to do with the binding between the platelets and the VWF. It goes through a protein called GP1BA1. We will not spend a lot of time on it, but in the literature, there's actually only the kinetics rates of K on and K off. And if you look at K on and K off, it is really a combination of two other things that are happening in what I call a non-equilibrium state. We can say that these two species come together because of fluid mechanics. So the transport can be there and we can calculate how much that is. What is less known is what is happening to these bonds and is there an intrinsic rate of them reacting together that is independent of this transport. Unfortunately, when you do a K on K off, you have both combined. So what we have tried to do is de um, decouple these two. And from that, we can get e uh, the 
uh, in transport rates from the fluid mechanics side, and that gives us the intrinsic rate here. And that's what we needed to model in our system in order to get closure for all of this. So this is what it looks like. So here we have a, a situation of platelets here. The platelets are more dense, but the VWF is actually not more dense for concentration. So this is what, the, uh, what it starts like at the beginning with no flow, and then we'll start flow, and then it will cause these platelets to associate with the VWF and, um, and aggregate. So just for orientation, this is a side view and this is a top view from looking down from above. So here you can see that there are some platelets to stick on the surface as singletons, but that's not the interesting part. There are in the flow, there are actually large aggregates that form because the VWF wraps around these and then will accumulate them. So they cause aggregation in the flow and then they are captured. So I'll show this one more time. I cannot show it one more time. Yeah. So this is just from those first principles as only the physics. And you see that it aggregates and then is captured. And all of this is occurring in just a few milliseconds. So this rate is actually sufficiently fast to cause the full uh, occlusion that we were seeing before. In order to do all this, we really have to look at multi-scale hierarchies for this thrombosis model. There's a molecular level that we've talked about here, and there's a cellular level of the, all of the migration that's occurring. But in order to get to that tissue level, we need to have a large amount of thrombus forming. So at the molecular level, we can deal with GP1BA1 bonds. At the cellular level, we want to have this microthrombi formation. And our part of our work is to try and you have this feedback loop of platelet activation that supplies more VWF on that area. So we have shown that alpha granules must actually degranulate in order to create this um, situation. And then that will give us our occlusive macrothrombi formation. If any of you are working on this type scale, this length scale between 10 to the minus nine and 10 to the minus four, and time scales between 10 to the minus six to 10 to the third time scales, you recognize that this is a Difficult problem to do, but we're trying to connect these interfaces um, for a multi-scale problem. So let's switch gears to a clinical problem. So the clinical problem is that we need to know who's going to clot and who's not going to clot. If you're at risk for heart attacks, then you would actually not want to clot. But if you're at risk for trauma, which is a younger paper, patient population, you do want to clot. So we wanted to create a clinical assay using microfluidics for blood handling to provide the patient risk of sudden cardiac death, and then to, to provide the dosage requirements as an assay to say whether they should be on aspirin or Plavix or dual antifluid therapy. Our first generation machine here took 25 mLs and had a variability of 35%, which is really not great, but is actually matches all the other platelet function analyzers that are out there. This was done uh, uh, about eight, 10 years ago. And we were able to change, convert this microfluidic system into something much simpler. And this is what Viviana had worked on with in our lab. She created this single use cartridge that could go in here. The microfluidics is made into a very small chamber here that can be mass produced. And so you put in this vacutainer of, of blood into this system. Uh, there's a motor that pulls it down and it's just one button that the person puts in. And the readout is very simple. It's an optical readout. It shows how much blood does it take to cause clotting. Here are the innards with a microcontroller and pump. So she was able to do this and we got to five mLs of blood that's necessary to do this and the variability is uh, less than 4%, which beats all the other uh, platelet function analyzers. And ours is the only one really with SEPA. So that's our other competitive advantage. This whole process takes approximately five minutes to do, and a nurse can do this. So he or she can just put in the tube, put in the single use cartridge and get the readout in five minutes. So that allows us to be what's called a point of care device that can be used in the clinics. Other things that we try and do for the clinical side is therapy. And so we got this idea that charged nanoparticles might be interesting. 
And um, uh, we didn't go very much into it, but VWF, in order to roll up the platelets, have to be elongated. They're elongated by high shear. And when they elongate, they can attract all the platelets. So we thought, well, these VWFs are actually full of positive charges. And if they're positive charges, can we put a negative charge in that area and cause them to roll up? And so we did some simulations here. And the simulation is just with VWF and won't show my movie. I'm sorry, it did work a few seconds ago, but um, or minutes ago when I was practicing. The, um, these platelets, I mean, sorry, these nanoparticles cause these VWF to roll up and they will form these aggregates in the globular shape and cause them to fold up. And that, that was at least our prediction under shear conditions. With the charged nanoparticles, we wanted to test would that actually occur in, in a, an experiment. So we put charged nanoparticles in here and under the control condition in our microfluidics, it causes occlusion as you've seen before. But with these nanoparticles that are charged, there is not occlusion for uh, three times the length. So it doesn't cause occlusion until three times longer. And there's a dose response curve where if you put more of these nanoparticles into this sector, then it causes the occlusion time to extend for as much as 10 times as long. So this allows us to show that nanoparticles or the nanotechnologies could be used. This is an unusual area because nanoparticles are typically used as drug carriers to carry some other drug. But here we just use the physics of it as charged particles. And because it's a physics-based problem, then it's actually a uh, medical device instead of a pharmaceutical. And the pathway through FDA is much, much faster, probably 10 times faster at much uh, lower cost. So this is a way of using physics to change uh, this behavior without using pharmacology. Let's go to a different system. Another system is ECMO, extracorporeal membrane oxygenators. And these are used to keep kids and actually adults alive too. You take the blood out of them when they are too tired. So a kid, a child often is just too tired to breathe when they are sick. And if they're too tired to breathe, then they just stop breathing and then they die. So you can take the blood out of them and put them through an oxygenator, which you can't see in this system because it's actually out of the view, field of view. And it's a form of life support. The problem with this is that even though it provides oxygen exchange, there is often either bleeding or clotting and anticoagulation problems that continually plague the, the care of these patients. Give you another look of this. There is actually a child up here in this incubator and all this other stuff is used to draw the blood out and create that oxygenation. So in the ICU, there's a lot of fluid mechanics and technology that is used to keep these children alive. Our problem is to think about the clots. The ECMO oxygenator actually collects a lot of these clots and we can collect those, but they are not actually adhering. So they're not forming here. This is just actually act, uh, acting as a filter. So in fact, if we take out these circuits, we find that most of the clots are that the connectors. There are about, often 12 connectors in the system, which you have to go to a roller or a centrifugal pump and all that tubing needs to change and connect to different things. So these connectors are typically up to 100% of all the connectors, since they're two sides, you can have actually greater than 100%, but there are few clots on the actual tubing. It's the connectors that are the problem. So if we look at these connectors, they form these clots and they can totally occlude that. And, but they're almost always forming right at this edge at the connector change. It's not from the, the material surface, but that change. And if you look at that, it fluid mechanically, you find that this is a region of low shear stress, and that low shear stress can cause thrombus to form right at that edge. This thrombus, unfortunately, is, is not SEPA, but it's coagulation. And so we find that this coagulation clot, which shows up as fibrin and red blood cells, can be treated with heparin. However, people have found that ECMO circuits not always just fixed by heparin. 
And so we looked at the other components of it. There's a centrifugal pump often in these, and there's a pin here that uh, the inflow comes from here and it goes to um, a centrifugal pump and it can form these clots that are huge. So the clots here, if you look at the shear stress on there, is very high and that can cause shear induced platelet aggregation. And this type of problem is not coagulation, so would need to be treated with antiplatelet agents. So a different clinical problem leads to a different fluid mechanics problem, which leads to a different treatment problem treatment solution. So our team here that we have now is uh, Viviana Claveria that came from Montpellier. So thank you very much for, she's been a uh, delight to work with. Um, Chris Brissett is uh, my senior PhD student. Gian is a, a mid-range senior uh, PhD student. And Sagar Bakshi is the surgeon working on this. Uh, we typically have an MD in our lab. There's a, a a new graduate student, Edouard Macano, who comes from France, also working on this, but uh, I was not able to show any of his work because he's just starting. So this is our team that um, is working in this interdisciplinary section. In conclusion, the interdisciplinary problems lead to interdisciplinary solutions. One is that the clinical uh, thrombosis and hemostasis affects everyone. We are all subject to potential either uh, severe bleeding or heart attacks. And so it's an important area to work on. It needs microfluidics for in vitro testing. It needs biophysics and CFD modeling to understand the mechanisms and make good predictions that you can't do by just trial and error. We need fluid mechanics to determine all these extreme shear stress situations like in the pump. Um, we need microscopy, all the, the limits of this, microscopy for fast imaging and quantification. We need nanoscientists to propose novel therapies that haven't been proposed by the biochemists. And we need technology translation to bring these solutions to patients as, as products that the patients and physicians can use. All this needs uh, close collaboration with the MDs to help guide diagnosis and therapy and keep the engineers working on a very clinically relevant pathway. Thank you very much. I hope this is interesting to you. And uh, at this time, I'll turn it over to, to Manuk. Thank you, David. Fascinating talk. It's exactly what, what we wanted, this, uh, this interdisciplinarity that is really uh, uh, helping to understand a very complex question like the one that you just presented. So I will ask people just to uh, uh, raise their hand if they want to ask a question or just uh, switch on their mic. And, and, and ask their question, uh, please. Um, whoever wants to start can start. And if not, I have questions, so <laughs> <laughs> many actually. <laughs> okay, I can maybe start if there is nobody else. No, there is Alphonse that is wanting to start. Okay. Sure. All right, thank you. Thank you, David, for a great lecture. You, 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 you pointed to the two different kinds of clots that you, uh, that you have studied. And, you may know that uh, now with this uh, treatment option for strokes, a thrombectomy, that we can actually study a whole range of clots as they are removed from the body after, after a stroke. And then if you look at the, at the histology of these clots and, and you say compare the, the amount of, of red blood cells versus the, the amount of fibrin and platelets, you basically see that all kinds of compositions uh, are found. And, do, do, do you have any idea of, of what that could be? I mean, uh, the high shear leading to these white clots and low shear leading to these uh, red blood cell rich clots, but basically we find everything in between. So, so any, any ideas where we should be looking for? What is the etiology of these kinds of clots? Sure. So our, our problem with using clinical specimens, I think clinical specimens are, are incredibly useful for us to get there, but as people have found, these clots that you retrieve from patients hours later or sometimes days later are very mixed. And if you think about the process that, we're, uh, that I've pointed out to you here in, uh, in this one, a white clot can form in the time frame, let's say 30, 30 minutes in order to get an occlusive clot. However, yeah. once you cause occlusion, then it will cause stagnation conditions upstream and downstream of that. And 
around that, you should have coagulation clots that form. And we uh -huh. are actually now pre reproducing in this laboratory, in our laboratory setting, that when we look at time involved, then these clots change. Not only do right. they change with the composition because you have more and more coagulation clots forming behind and, uh, and downstream of the white clot, but the clots themselves have uh, the platelets that contract. And so they yeah. change both their composition and their density and um, right. So we're, right now we're looking at studies across time to try and see what happens after one hour, what comes after, after nice. six, 24 hours, 48 hours, and they're remarkably different. <laughs> so David, you, you're suggesting what is, uh, what is retrieved in this thrombectomy. Yeah? So, so typically after an onset of stroke, these clots are removed within a few hours from the body, right. but, but that could be the result of all kinds of things happening on these on these highly stenosed uh, arteries, where 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 clots can embolize and and in in, in, in different compositions, and so right. it, it it is a highly dynamic uh, environment. Then, right. I'm not sure what we're looking at if 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 we look at these compositions. Right. So that's why we think that a laboratory model is still useful for defining the time periods. I because see. When someone has a stroke, you cannot say, oh, wait, I want to <laughs> no. do your studies and, 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 and no. time this and everything. That's, that's going to be hard to get. Thank you. Thank you, Alphonse. Next. Maybe now, Frank, you can ask until someone else has maybe switch on his mic. Well, actually, uh, Alphonse, uh, asked more or less the same questions that I wanted to ask about this, uh, what is in between red and white, basically. So um, David has already discussed this. So uh, maybe another one. Uh, um, so uh, I, 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 I didn't get everything when you presented this uh, new device that you, uh, uh, that you have designed, this thrombo check or thrombo something, I don't remember the name. Yes. So if you could uh, maybe elaborate a bit more, I, I didn't get it. Uh, OK. So one is that we want to just measure the clotting ability under high shear conditions, okay? But I want it to make it simple to use for the physicians. The previous microfluidic system took our PhD students an entire day to prepare and run the study and all that type of thing. But in fact, the event is short in time. So we wanted to make it simple for the physicians to use in the clinic type of situation to be able to stratify people that are likely to clot by this mechanism in a short, you know, uh, are more prone to that compared to those that have an extended um, uh, SEPA time. That is the goal of, of dual antiplatelet therapy after stents. If you um, give a person stents, generally they will get dual antiplatelet therapy because they don't want to have the platelet clotting on top of that. Unfortunately, that only affects about 5% of the people and the rest of them that get all this dual antiplatelet therapy are subject to having bleeding problems. So we want to be able to test those people that, are, that need to be treated, whether they naturally have prolonged clotting times, and then they should not get aspirin and persantine or, or aspirin and um, Plavix, I mean, or some other type of uh, antiplatelet agent. And if they have too much of it, then we could also tell. So that's an assay. We can also use this for trauma patients. If traumatic patients, they often have some problems with their bleeding or coagulation or stopping or hemostasis, I should say. It's a really hemostasis problem. And so if they have their platelets that are not functioning properly, then we can give them replacement therapy with more platelets. But it could be that they need more VWF instead of platelets. And we can titrate that actually with this assay. Thank Amazon. you. Thank you. Next, uh, Simon. Yes. So thanks a lot for the, for the great talk with uh, was really really excellent uh, and um, I have actually two questions uh, a small one about uh, you, you talked about the venturi effect I was wondering if there is some kind of collapse of the of the artery uh, possible and if is 
is it meaningful in some way? And the other question is that you mentioned platelet activation as a scenario, but then it disappeared from your talk. We didn't talk about platelet activation. I was uh, wondering if you could comment more about that. Okay. Both of those things are interesting topics on their own, and it unfortunately takes a, a lot of uh, more work but the, uh, or to describe. So in a Venturi, you have a situation where the pressure goes down, Bernoulli's equation. And uh, Professor Pedley, who's on, um, has uh, worked a lot on collapsible tubes. And in fact, that same thing can happen. So we have made stenotic tubes and made them elastic. If you make them elastic, then they will collapse on themselves. But once it starts to collapse, then the flow goes down and the pressure goes back up. And so it reopens. So you have a cyclic phenomenon of collapse and reopening that can occur with um, most elastic vessels. And that can be defined by a speed index to look at the local wave speed in that and the local velocity. And so you can calculate at what percent stenosis and what mechanical elasticity you would have in order to get collapse. So there is, uh, we've uh, done work in that and others have done work on that type of thing. And so that definitely can occur and, um, in, in, in arteries. The, I think that actually is what contributes to plaque cap rupture. So when you have all this occurring, this, this stenosis, you have to have a surface to get those platelets to attract to it. And if you go through this cyclic fatigue, then you can expose collagen and get platelets to occur. That would be a catastrophic condition. And that's, I think, what is contributing to plaque cap rupture, which is the final event. Your other question has to do with uh, platelet uh, um, activation. We find that platelets going through our high shear region stick before they have time to activate. It <laughs> takes minutes for them to activate. So, uh, Dr. Ruggieri showed um, uh, back in around 2006 that these platelets actually stick under these conditions without being activated. He put in platelets that could not be activated and showed that they all stick to that. However, once they stick to it, then they are exposed to shear rates that are high for minutes. And then after minutes, then they release VWF. They have 50 times the concentration of VWF in their alpha granules, then they don't. And so we have shown that if you take away those alpha granules, then it doesn't go to occlusion. So they need to activate later in order to release enough VWF to grow very rapidly. And so that's what we call rapid platelet accumulation. It's a local delivery system that causes that to clock. So there is activation just later. It's not, not at the first. Okay. Thanks for that. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. Uh, next online is uh, Christian. Yeah, hello. Thank you for this uh, nice talk. So this is Christian from Saarbrücken, and also thanks to Montpellier for opening the seminar for everyone. Somehow it's convenient to have like conference talks like like that. So thanks a lot. Um, so my question actually is: we are focusing quite a bit on the white uh, clots, and um, do you have an idea why in the red clots apparently a lot of red blood cells get trapped, but not in the white clots, or the other way around? Yes. Um, well, some of this is conjecture and some of it is uh, our evidence. So our, our models of the platelets attaching are that the VWF grab platelets and they grab it by what's called a GP1B receptor that is on the platelets. They are not grabbing RBCs or red blood cells because they don't have that GP1B. Mm -hmm. So you need the VWF to grab the um, the platelets and they grab them out of the flow and then accumulate them and then grab them. So that's how we can uh, densify all the platelets. Under a stagnant condition, you sort of just get all the cells that are there okay. and the red blood cells are predominant. And then once the coagulation proteins all set, they will have some platelets in there, but it's just going to be 1% and the rest of it's going to be red blood cells. That, okay. that is our explanation or a hypothesis, put it that way. Thank you. Thank you, Christian. Next in line is Kisu. Yeah, hello, uh, Professor Ku. That's a fascinating talk. Uh, this is Chi from the University of Edinburgh. I noticed that in reality, in the process of uh, in, in thrombosis, you have the factor of uh, pulsation. Do you think that's an important factor 
uh, or have you considered that in your microfluidic experiments, for example, to introduce the positivity to see how that affect uh, the adhesion and also the growth of the the, the different ingredients on the uh, vessel wall? Yes. So positivity, it really it's important and not important. It depends on what time scale you're looking at and what event you're trying to look at. So if you're looking at the growth of this thrombus that occurs over five to 20 minutes, the amount of pulsatility changing the mass transfer is actually low. It's just on a time scale situation. Pulsatility is one per second. And then these other events are maybe 20 minutes. And so the pulsatility is not very effective for that time scale. However, if you look at the unfolding of VWF, the VWF unfolds very rapidly, almost instantaneously. The, um, the, these are occurring in less than millisecond timescales, in microsecond timescales. So there, the pulsatility can have the effect of causing an accordion-like situation for these VWF. And we have not included that in our microfluidic system, partially because it's difficult to create a high Struhall number flow in microfluidics. If you can imagine that, the, the situation is that the viscosity and the dimensions are so small that your Reynolds number is often one or less than one. So your Wormersley number is very small, so it is hard to create that. However, in computations, you can create that and create those types of conditions that will look at that micro scale. The hard part is then computational time because <laughs> you know, to do a whole cycle is a, so it is at the edge of our knowledge. And I hope that you or some other people can work on this too, because these are all hard problems, but they're good questions that you have. Thank you. <laughs> Muriel, please. You can, you can switch on your mic because we are not hearing you. Thank you. Thank you very much for this excellent talk. I just have a, a question. There's a, a physiology called proteases that cuts von Willebrand factor Adams to 13. And um, as elong elongated factor Willebrand is the skeleton of the clot, could we use this uh, protease to maybe to reduce the clot or maybe to, to, to use the, the particles you're talking about that could bear this, uh, this uh, proteases and uh, deliver it to the clot, uh, just wondering. Right, so um, that is a fantastic idea and people have tried to use the uh, Adams TS-13 to try and um, reduce the, either the VWF and it definitely can cause VWF to get smaller. So it's released in ultra long VWF and Springer and others have shown uh, that, it, it, that Adams TS can cut that up when it's soluble VWF. However, once it's incorporated in the clot, it doesn't seem to be as nearly as effective. And we're not quite sure why, but um, uh, like Simone de Meyer and uh, other people have, have tried to use Adams TS 13 to cause lysis or prevent clots, and it hasn't worked very well, okay? It has an effect, but just not very strong. In our laboratory, we took a different approach and we used something that um, Jose Lopez suggested of using NAC, that's N-acetylcysteine. Uh, and we used uh, N-acetylcysteine and we were able to get uh, actually a different version of it, it's called DINAC, uh, the di um, version of, of DINAC it's called. And we were able to get um, very dramatic lysis of these clots. The clots went from our millimeter sized clots to completely uh, opening up the entire vessel within 10 minutes. Um, that was uh, just um, published fairly recently, our, our work on Dynac. I can't tell you exactly how that's working because <laughs> NAC and DINAC, uh, it should work with the disulfide bonds, but there are a gazillion disulfide bonds. So we are not sure why it's working. We think it is really fascinating that it's working. We're also looking at some aptamers to try and see what we can do to cause lysis or prevention. But we, in our hands, 
and actually some other groups, um, NAC and DINAC have been much more successful than Adams TS-13. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mariela. Next question is Christian again, Christian speaker this time. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for the great presentation, also from my side. Um, uh, following up on the uh, um, unfolding of von Willebrand Factor, uh, I'm wondering, so you've talked about the unfolding of VWF under high shear. Um, have you also considered the, the role of elongational flows and how would you rate the importance of, of these? Uh, right, I think they are both contributory and you can separate them, at least in our mind. As mechanics people, we can think about elongational flows as different from rotational flows, and you can actually create experiments for each of these individually. As we see it right now, we think that the elongational flows um, are important for elongating VWF, and you have to elongate VWF in order to get all of this process to go for SEPA. However, with our computational results of aggregating the platelets, Turns out the VWF needs to wrap around, or it does wrap around these platelets and interconnect between platelets. So in order to get these big aggregates, you need to have something rotate as well. So we think that both of those take a little bit of time. If you take too short a time, then you can stop it from happening. But there's a, a part that you would need for elongation and a part that you would need for rotation. In a time sequence, we think the elongation needs to come first in order to get the long strands and then the rotation second. But now we're trying to parse fractions of milliseconds. And, um, but I think that, that we'll probably need to have both to get these very large aggregates to form. Thank you. Thank you, Christian. Next. Uh... Uh, no, I'm not seeing anyone. So I, I, I will ask my question, but my okay. questions actually. And may, maybe it's related to what just Christian asked you about the elong elongational flow, because you told us that uh, high shear rates will induce this aggregation. But what if now I maintain the shear rate constant, let's say high, but not super high, but I change the curvature of the flow uh, around. So for example, uh, I don't know, I make a constriction smaller and smaller, but the, at the constant shear rate, should I get something that will uh, uh, stay um, at a given length and an aggregate that will not grow or still I will get the growth? Uh, it's just time that, uh, that will change, the time scale of growth that will change depending on that curvature. Yeah, we see that it's quite shear dependent, at least in our hands and our, uh, and, and some other people have also, Arts has looked at, the dependence of the aggregation rate or the growth rate as a function of shear. And so it ha has this shape, a general shape that is a hump. So there, it, it reaches its apex or the fastest growth somewhere around 20,000 inverse seconds. Okay. Before that, it grows slower, not, you know, it, and you can and quantify all this. And then above 20,000, it, it, drops off, the growth rate is low, but it's still positive. And I'm amazed that even at 100,000 inverse seconds, there are still platelets that are accumulating. The growth is still higher. So um, as the stenosis gets more and more thrombotic, then the shear rate must go up because you're getting smaller and smaller and narrow. Uh, and so it has, in order to go to occlusion, it has to sweep through a wide range of shear rates. So if you wanted to keep a constant shear rate, then you need to have a system that doesn't change its dimensions very much, which is what the thrombus is doing, or you need to expand it. And that's, you can see that that's not easy to do. It is possible to do it, but um, it would be harder to do that. And then you could do individual shear rates. We instead took the different uh, shear and growth rates over time as it grew and just ensemble averaged many of those to get our, our overall curve. And from that, what we can do is predict the occlusion time for a wide range of things. So we use that to predict the occlusion time in microfluidics all the way up to aortic um, aneurysm graphs, the uh, AAA stent graphs that are uh, 10, mil 10 millimeters in diameter. And 
our prediction actually holds by just using that one growth rate that occurred. It, it, it's uh, within 10% generally, so. Okay, and if there is not another question, I will ask my second one. Um, it was fascinating to see this movie of, um, of a platelet aggregation in this, uh, in this polymer solution, let's say. Do you have a, a precise mechanism of why they are aggregating? Um, yes, so that uh, the mechanism of that is <laughs> described in a paper that is should be coming out in blood advances shortly. It's, okay. it's under the second review. And um, so, but that that describes the, the, the rotation, the aggregation and capture in more detail and um, in more results to show why we think uh, this can explain VWD, the different types of von Willebrand's disease, type one, type two, and type three diseases. Okay, okay, then we'll wait for the paper. <laughs> okay, <laughs> hopefully it will come out maybe this year, but probably the beginning of next year. Okay, we're reaching, I think, the end almost. So last question, maybe Nixa, please. We can't no, we don't you. hear you, you have to switch on your mic. Yeah. Thank you for this fascinating talk. I was wondering that you, uh, during your talk, you mentioned that this margination from the uh, red blood cell flexibility and the platelet rigidity can uh, uh, can be modeled with this continuum free, uh, free escape model. I was wondering what kind of continuum model you were talking about exactly, and uh, what is the, uh, from your um, aspect and from this clinical aspect, what is the most important stage that should be included in these continuum models, such as like this one Willebrand factor binding, or what is the most critical aspect that should be seen during this continuum modeling. Okay, so um, the continuum free escape condition for um, margination uh, is described in the physics review letters that, um, that uh, effectively we did the lattice Boltzmann technique to demonstrate how the platelets go off to the side, essentially from first principles. But then in doing that, we realized that most of it was because of this free escape and that free escape could be just as a simple function. And then if it's a simple function, then you don't have to do the whole fancy Lattice Boltzmann um, uh, calculation in order to get the margination right. So uh, you can calculate the margination now for a wide range of conditions just under continuum mechanics. So that helps explain what's going on from margination point of view. There are some problems that can be solved by continuum and others that need particulate solutions and others. And that depends on what type of question you're asking. It sort of leads to your second question, what's the most important to study? Oh, I think there's a wide range and that's what this great interdisciplinary conference can say. There's just, it's sort of like the elephant. You, each person does a little part of it and then it contributes to understanding that elephant. It's not the tail and it's not the trunk. Um, we, uh, I, some, yeah, I, I'm excited that many of you are, are potentially interested in this field because I find it fascinating and it's just work from, from lots of different areas can contribute. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. So if there's no other questions, I will give back the mic to uh, Frank for the last words and thank you, David. For all this. Thank you very much, Manu. Yeah, okay. First of all, I would like that we, yeah, to thank you very much, David. David, it was just a fascinating talk. Uh, thank you very much for this, uh, yeah, very nice, very nice uh, talk. Um, just to conclude, maybe two remarks. Uh, so, this, this talk and this session has been recorded. So, you should, uh, all of you, uh, uh, know more about this in, a, in the next few days or maybe next week so that you can uh, listen again to David. And uh, also, you are welcome to, to look at and to listen to the uh, previous um, uh, sessions of this uh, series. Uh, they are available in our website, so we will have uh, more details by email uh, very soon. And also, um, to mention that uh, so the next uh, uh, seminar should be organized in early 2022, so maybe in uh, three, four months from now. And again, you will be uh, uh, informed, of course, uh, 
um, by email as soon as we have the, the name of, and the title of the seminar. Okay, thank you very much uh, to all of you for attending and uh, hope to see you soon. And thank you. Bye. Hope to see you soon in person. <laughs> yeah. Bye-bye, you know, everyone. Okay. Bye-bye. Thank you. Au revoir. Thanks a lot. Bye.